Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. In this session, uh, we will talk about advanced GitOps concepts. GitOps has really become very popular in the Kubernetes communities in the last few years. And many organizations are adopting GitOps to increase developer experience, stability, reliability, standardization, and more importantly, the security. I'm Sheetal Joshi. I am a DA within EKS organization. I am joined by Islam Magum, who is a solutions architect at Container Services within AWS. So we are going to talk about advanced GitOps concepts and what it, GitOps practice is really all about, and infrastructure controllers. And one of the important and the challenging topic when we really talk about GitOps, which is a secrets management, and also an end-to-end -end multi-cluster GitOps solutions. We are going to provision and bootstrap few clusters, EKS clusters, and deploy applications onto those clusters all using GitOps. So what GitOps really is, and how does it differentiate from the traditional DevOps? So traditionally, we have used the CI pipelines. The CI pipelines actually watch for changes in the code that developers commit. It executes the build process, creates the images, and releases these images to the container registries. And there is a separate process, the CD, which actually watches for the Kubernetes manifest changes to reflect these image versions. Either the application developer or an automated process takes these changes and pushes the changes onto the Kubernetes cluster using some native case API, such as kubectl apply or kubectl exec. So how does it all change within the GitOps, right? So what you see here, the CI pipeline doesn't change. The developer is still going to make the changes to the code, commit to the GitOps, Git repositories, and the CI pipeline picks these changes, executes the build process, and creates the images, and then publishes this image to the ECI repository. So what changes is the CD pipeline here. Instead of a push model, there is a controller or an agent that is running within your Kubernetes cluster, which actually looks for the changes committed to the manifest repo and applies these changes to the Kubernetes cluster. So let's look at GitOps principle. So there are mainly four GitOps principle, and these principles really apply very well to the Kubernetes itself. In GitOps, the entire system is described declaratively. This covers the state of the applications, like number of replicas, the pods, and the resources allocated to your applications, as well as the cloud resources that application actually depend on, which run outside of your cluster. Another principle is that the desired state of the system is all managed and maintained within the Git, and Git becomes the canonical source of the truth. Right? This includes your applications as well as the infrastructure resources. And applying the change to the system is simple as creating a PR, getting it approved and merged. Once it is merged, actually the agent that is running within the cluster, which is actually monitoring these Git repositories, pulls in that change and then applies it to the cluster. And the last principle is that the software agent that is running within the cluster looking for the changes and any changes that are advertently made to the cluster itself, either by the cluster administrator or by manually, it detects those divergences and reconciles the system back that is defined on the Git. And reverting your system back to the previous state is as simple as pulling the previous change on that particular day that is defined in the kit and then doing the git revert onto the system. So let's talk about how it is implemented. There are multiple GitOps controllers today available. Flux and Argo CD are two of the major and the popular ones. Today's implementation that we are going to talk about uses Flux, the GitOps controller, so the details are going to be covered around the Flux. The Flux runs as an agent within the Kubernetes cluster, and it is implemented as a set of the CRDs, just like anything else in Kubernetes. And Amazon EKS team is planning for releasing a managed add-on support for GitOps soon. 
So when we spoke about the GitOps principles, we also talked about the entire system being handled very declaratively. So this also means any of the cloud resources that your application that depends on, just like as you see on the right hand side, those can be your database tables, the message queues, or the file system handlers like S3, or the, the cluster itself where your application actually runs on. You are seeing a flux managing an infrastructure controller here, which Islam is going to be talking about soon. So what are these infrastructure controllers are? So the infrastructure controllers add the set of the CRDs the, for the cloud resources that support, and the controllers running within the cluster watches for the changes to the CRDs or the addition of the CRDs, invoke the cloud APIs to provision and manage the cloud resources that are outside of your cluster. And AWS and EKS basically has supported or supports AWS cloud controllers for Kubernetes. Uh, we have added around 20 ACKs in the past year and then many more to come. So another such important and the popular controller for infrastructure is Crossplane. It's the same concept. It allows you to provision and manage cloud resources using Kubernetes CRDs. Unlike ACK, Crossplane support multiple cloud and not just AWS. It has the concept of the providers. It bundles the set of managed CRDs and their respective controllers and implements the APIs to create these cloud resources. Crossplane and another interesting concept is the composition. You can create the composite resources and basically implement these as an architectural blueprints and then hand it over to your teams and support multiple organizations. So in an example, if you consider EKS as a composition, you can actually define the VPCs, the subnets where you run your worker nodes and subnets that you use to create the clusters in, the managed node groups and the different add-ons all included and encapsulated in a single composition. So basically combining um, GitOps for applications and for infrastructure, you are increasing the velocity, you are increasing the developer experiences. And also you create the standardizations across your organizations. And more importantly, you are enhancing your security postures. So now I hand it over to Islam, who is going to talk about secrets management and also will demonstrate everything in action. Thank you, Shetal. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. As Shetal was saying at the beginning of the session, uh, one of the challenging subjects in, in uh, GitOps is secrets management. Let's start with defining what, what secrets are. In Kubernetes context, a secret is an object that contains a small amount of sensitive information. This can be a key, it can be a password, or, or it can be a token. In GitOps context, it can be the credentials used by the GitOps controller to connect to the repo and start re the reconciliation activities. In GitOps, all the manifests are meant to be on Git, but how can we put sensitive information like credentials or keys in Git in unencrypted form? That's where the challenge is. I'm going to talk about multiple strategies to address this challenge. The first of these involves storing the secret information or the sensitive data in an external secret store. This can be AWS Secret Manager, or it can be, for example, HashiCorp Vault. And have a controller running on the cluster. This controller job is to reconcile or synchronize this secret information that exists in the external secret to the Kubernetes cluster. This way, what we have in Git is just a pointer to the sensitive information that exists in the external store, right? But, but the information itself is stored securely in, in the secret store, in the secret store. Examples for tools that use this strategy are external secrets operator, which allow you to like synchronize secrets that you have in AWS Secret Manager, for example, to your Kubernetes cluster in the form of a Kubernetes secret. Another tool is a secret store CSI driver. This allows you to, to uh, like synchronize, again, the secret information in your secret store as a volume and mount this to one of your bots. And you can optionally also synchronize this to a Kubernetes secret. The other strategy 
involves storing the secret information in GET, but storing it in an, in an encrypted, encrypted form rather than being unencrypted. In this case, you also have, you need a controller running on the cluster. The controller job is slightly different in this case. A job will be more of like decrypting the information and making it consumable by the applications running on the cluster. So you, as a practitioner or contributor, before you add your secret information to get, you encrypt it using a public key. And then when the Flux or the GitOps controller apply this, it gets unencrypted and made consumable by the application. Tools that uses this approach or this strategy are Sealed Secret and Mozilla SOPS. We have talked about GitOps controllers. We have talked also about infrastructure controllers and how we can use it to extend GitOps beyond just the native Kubernetes objects to cover like cloud resources running outside the Kubernetes cluster. And we also talked about the challenge related to secrets and strategies for addressing that. Now let's see how we can build an end-to-end -end system, multi-cluster, that can support the use cases of like applications and the platform teams. Let's start with use cases. In SDLC, there are several personas involved. One of these personas is the platform engineers. Platform engineers should be able to create new clusters. And they should be able also to update these clusters. Like, and this up, by update, I mean like changing the Kubernetes version of the control plane, of the data plane, uh, maybe changing the number of worker nodes, changing the instance family or the instance size. Also, platform engineers need to be able to delete or decommission clusters when they are no longer needed. They should be able to bootstrap these clusters with different tooling. This can be logging tooling, monitoring. It can be controllers, like ingress controllers, for example. They need to be able to bootstrap these clusters or install, or install tools on top of these clusters. You should be able to update and manage these tools, like move to higher versions when released. Or maybe replace tools altogether, like uninstall tools and, and install others that are proven to be more suitable for the organization use cases. Another persona is the application developers. Application developers should be able to deploy applications into these provisioned clusters. And sometimes these applications will just consist of native Kubernetes objects, like deployment, services, config maps, and it may have dependency on cloud resources, as Shadow was explaining. These cloud resources can be like DynamoDB, S3 objects, or whatever, right? So uh, application developers need to provision these cloud resources or dependencies as part of the deployment of the application. They should be able also to update applications. By that, I mean releasing new, uh, like uh, rolling out new releases of the applications and doing any associated changes on the cloud resources dependencies. Also, the application developer should be able to undeploy applications when they are no longer needed. And some organizations run multi-tenant clusters, clusters that are shared between multiple application teams, maybe for optimizing cost, maybe for reducing operational overhead, multiple reasons. In this case, some level of governance needs to be in place to control which applications get to which clusters. For example, and there can be multiple factors that are considered in this decision. Maybe, for example, criticality. Maybe the, uh, the, we want to prevent applications of low criticality from getting deployed into clusters that are used for hosting mission critical applications. Or maybe compliance. Maybe, for example, you want applications that need to be PCI compliant. You want these applications just to get deployed into specific set of clusters that are provisioned with the PCI controls. So the governance team, we should be able to support them, like approve or reject application onboarding requests into specific clusters to support these multi-tenant clusters. Let's see how, how we can address all these use cases now. We're going to use hub and spoke model to, to address these use cases, a concept that was explained in previous sessions as well. We're going to have a management cluster, which is going to be like the hub. And this management cluster will be used for provisioning workload clusters. Right? How can we provision workload clusters using another cluster? Here comes a concept of infrastructure controllers. At the end, an, a workload cluster is just another, is just another cloud resource, similar to like DynamoDB tables or SKS queues. There's a lot of similarity here. So we can use infrastructure controllers like Crossplane for provisioning workload clusters or spokes, 
where we are going to deploy applications. And here comes the concept uh, feature, a cross-plane feature that is very handy here, is a cross-plane compositions, where you can like define a new CRD that, that uh, like encapsulate all the resources needed for having a fully functioning AKS cluster. Chitra spoke about that in, in, in a previous slide, right? So the first step in, in deploying such system is to create this hub or this management cluster. And this is just one time activity that you do it as part of the uh, solution deployment or solution setup. You can use different tools for, for doing this one time activity. You may use Terraform, you may use EKS Cattle or, or uh, like CloudFormation or EKS Blueprints. Once you have that cluster, you provision it, you, you bootstrap it with, with uh, Flux. And as part of that, you provide the details of a get repo, which will has the manifests that describe the desired state of these workload clusters. We need to provision for different, different departments and different teams within our organization. We call this repo here GetOps system. So this repo will contain, as I said, the manifest for the workload clusters that you need to provision. And it will also contain the manifest for different tooling that need to be installed on the management cluster and workload clusters. Those can be like secret management tooling, like sealed secret, external secrets operator, all these tools that we spoke about. It can be, it, it, it should, it also one of these tools is cross-plane, which is needed to provision these workload clusters. So you put the manifests for tools and workload cluster inside the GitOps system repo, Flux start reconciling that repo. Let's assume now one of your departments, a team within a department in your organization created, the, created or developed an application and they want to get it deployed. The first step, they need a workload cluster to run this application on. So the platform team can go to this GitOps system repo that you see at the bottom of the slide as a manifests for this workload cluster needed for that application. Right? Or we can enable more of a self-service model. The application teams themselves can create a PR on that repo with the manifests for this workload clusters that they need for their applications. Once this, these manifests are merged into, into the GitOps system repo, Flux starts reconciling it and applying it to the management cluster. Once it's applied, Crossplane starts acting on it and the provision a workload cluster for you based on the manifests that you added to the repo. The workload cluster comes with Flux installed in, into it. Flux start reconciling the GitOps system repo as well. Why do you, does it need to reconcile GitOps get, get system repo? To install the different tools needed on these workload clusters. Maybe, for example, a secret management tool, ingress controller. You may, for this specific workload cluster, it may, it, may, uh, it may have applications that need to receive inbound traffic from outside the cluster. In this case, they may need the controller like the AWS Load Balancer controller to be able to receive traffic from uh, outside the cluster through load balancers. Islam, we do see here uh, installed on the workload clusters as well, right? Apart from the management cluster. So can you please talk about the thought process or the design idea that we have went with to implement flux and cross flowing on the workload clusters. Right, this is a conscious, a conscious decision that we made to deploy flux and cross plane, like have different instances for these on each of the clusters. There were two choices, either we have flux and cross plane on the management cluster and use this to manage the entire fleet, all the workload clusters, all the cloud resources required for all application, all of these clusters, right? Or go with a model like what we did here, where we have separate controllers on, uh, on, uh, on each of the clusters. We decided to go with the later approach, and the reason is scalability, or one of the reasons is scalability. There's, there's a limit in terms of number of reconciliations that a single controller can do. If, if uh, we are deploying this sort of solution for a large organization, right, these organizations may have like tens of clusters, hundreds of clusters, and, and many applications just supporting all of these reconciliation and all of these cloud resources provisioning with one set of controllers may not be very scalable. Another reason is to reduce dependency on the management cluster. If for any reason this management cluster availability is impacted, right, we will not be able to provision new workload clusters, but at least with this architecture, we can continue to reconcile 
all the application repo using the Flux controllers that exist on the workload cluster. And the cross-plane will also provision the cloud resources needed for these applications. Yeah, and the Flux that we see here can be replaced by Argo CD at any point. Like if you have the organizations or the teams within your companies who says we want uh, Argo and not Flux, you should be able to plug and play Flux, um, Argo CD in place of the Flux. Yeah, go ahead. You can control this with IAM permissions, right? So you can, um, you can, for each of these controllers, you can use RSA for controlling the level of permissions that, uh, that controls the resources that you can provision with these cross-plane controls. Okay. Then once, once the workload cluster is, is created, another repo that the Flux controller on that workload cluster is configured to reconcile is this GitOps workload repo. We'll talk about this shortly. Before, before discussing this, let's see how the application piece gets into, into this architecture. First, first, with this architecture, we have provisioned a new workload cluster, which just get operations. We just added a bunch of YAML manifests into the GitOps system repo, and this triggered the creation of a workload cluster. We haven't created any pipelines. We haven't had to log into any of the clusters and execute commands. It's just like a bunch of controllers running on these clusters and YAML manifests and get operations done by the different like participants or different collaborators in this system that triggered the creation of a fully fledged workload clusters with the required controls and tooling. The application developers now, they come into, they created a new application, they have created a new repo for that. This new repo has the manifest for this application, right? How can we get the flux in the workload cluster to start reconciling this application repo and deploying the application? This is where the GitOps workload repo comes into the picture. The flux controller on the workload cluster is configured to reconcile the GitOps workload, a specific folder in GitOps workload repo as part of the provisioning and bootstrapping activities. What we can do is, inside this GitOps workload repo, add the manifests that instruct the Flux to start monitoring a new repo, right? You can think of it as a reconciliation, creating another reconciliation. In, Ar in Argo CD, they call this app of apps pattern, right? It's some sort of recursion. You have a reconciliation pre-configured on the provisioned uh, cluster and you use that to create another reconciliation that, that reconciles the new repo created by the application team. And there are other multi-tenancy controls that we will talk about shortly in the demo. So the application developer go to the GitOps workload, adds them reconciliation manifests, right? And then here comes the governance team. The governance team look into these, look into this PR raised by the application development team. Right. Make sure that this application can go to this cluster they are trying to deploy to. Right. Make sure the multi-tenancy control are in place. And then approve this request or this PR. Once it's approved, it's merged, picked up by Flux, and then Flux starts reconciling the application trip. And that's what triggers the deployment of the application. The application, this application repo can contain manifests for native Kubernetes objects like deployments, config maps, services, and it may contain cross-plane manifests for provisioning the cloud resources that the application has dependency on. That is where, how we can handle this application part. You can scale this system as much as you want. You can add more uh, like workload clusters. You can deploy more than more applications to these workload clusters. You can scale it as, as much as you want. Now I would like to show you the GitOps structure, these repos, and how they look like.
So this is a GitOps system repo, right? You can see here, we have the cluster, clusters config folder. Under this folder, we're going to, create, to, to add the manifests that describe the desired state of the different workload clusters that we need to provision. As of now, we just have one workload cluster in the system, which is commercial staging. It, it acts as part of the staging environment for an imaginary commercial department within an organization. If you looked here, you will find a subfolder called definitions. Inside this folder, there is a YAML file that describes the desired state of this workload cluster. Its name is commercial staging, for example. It is in US East one. Networking details are, uh, are described here, or added here, like the VBC details, the CIDR range, subnets. And you have here also the Kubernetes version of the control plane, the Kubernetes version of, of the data plane, and, and uh, like number of worker nodes, et cetera. And you can basically extend these to create different templates for different organizations. Say some of the organization require only private only clusters, then you can configure those um, at the composition, composition level. Right, so what we provided here is like a template folder. This is like a baseline for all the workload clusters. So for any new workload clusters, instead of starting from scratch, you make a copy of this template folder and you can do like any changes uh, needed, maybe change the Kubernetes version or something of that sort, right? So templates, here we just have one template, but it may happen that you need to support multiple templates in your organization, maybe private clusters, public clusters, and I mean, all different kind of patterns. So we can have multiple templates to serve that purpose. In addition to, to the, this folder where we have the manifests uh, this is where we're using the cross-plane composition, by the way. So this AKS cluster, this is a composition that we created ourselves, right, for, that contains the VBCs, the subnets, and all of these resources. We have another folder here for tools. Like part of our use cases was like installing tools. So here we have a folder that contains the manifests for different tools that need to be installed in the cluster. Here I just have four tools, like AWS Load Balancer Controller, Crossplane, Extended Secret, Sealed Secret. But of course, you can uh, like uh, uh, extend this and add more tools based on the organization requirements. Some of these tools require configuration. That's why we have tools-config here. All right. In addition to GitOps System repo, there's GitOps Workloads repo. And this is where we have this governance piece, like instructing Flux to start reconciling new repo and deploying new applications. Here we have a folder for each cluster, and then we have a subfolder for each application deployed into that cluster. So what is needed to get Flux to deploy or reconcile new repos? First, we need to create a new a namespace for this application, right? So, so that is what this file is for. And then we have this file as well. This is like the reconciliation object. This is where, this is a manifest that will instruct Flux to start reconciling a new repo. And the new repo itself, where the details for that repo will exist, it is existing in that repo, in that YAML file, get-repo.yaml, right? Here we add the URL of, of the get repos that need to be reconciled for this specific application. And then comes the secret management piece. So for this, for Flux to connect to that repo and start reconciling it, it needs credentials. And these credentials cannot be in plain text in the get repo. So we need to, to use the secret management strategies that we explained earlier to secure these keys that will be used by Flux to connect to that repo and start reconciling it. Another important piece here is the service account. Um, this is more for the multi-tenancy control. You need to make sure that this application team cannot deploy resources into cube system, for example. They cannot deploy or change resources that belong to other tenants. So to control that, we are creating a service account as part of the onboarding requests. And these service account are this service account is used by the reconciliation object to pound the permissions given to that reconciliation and make sure that this application team cannot deploy into a namespace of another application team, cannot change system-wide resources. Same thing, we have created a template that you can use for new onboarding requests or for any applications that need to onboard. You copy this template, you make changes, like provide the details of the get repo, the keys after encrypting it, before you're adding it to get, and, and, and so on. Then comes 
the application reports. Application reports are, are, are straightforward. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. So uh, we have like here, uh, normal Kubernetes objects like deployment resources or deployment objects, service objects, uh, config maps. And you may have like cross-plane manifests for dependencies of that application. We iterated multiple times over that, just showing you an example for that. So this application, for example, has a dependency on a DynamoDB table. You see here we are using a Kubernetes manifest, CRD, provided by Crossplane for provisioning this cloud resource needed by that application. So it's like using the, cross, using the Kubernetes APIs, not just to cover deployments into Kubernetes, but to cover also cloud resources outside the Kubernetes. This is the, the power of infrastructure controller. You are unifying your operations on the Kubernetes APIs, whether your resources are running in the cluster or outside the cluster. So Islam, where does the IRSA configuration for um, this manifest reside? Right, so, so to be able to access this DynamoDB table from a board running in Kubernetes, you need IAM permissions, right? And, and these IAM permissions, I mean, can also be created with Crossplane. You can use Crossplane to create IAM roles and IAM policies. So as part of the onboarding of the applications here in this, in this folder that we, in this template that we explained, you here have this file app.com. I am, dash I am. This is where you put the permissions that, is need, that are needed by this application to, to be able to interact with these cloud resources living outside the Kubernetes cluster. And this is, this need to be reviewed and approved as part of the governance uh, process that we explained. So, so it will be part of the PR reviewed by the governance team and, and, and then merged and reconciled and then the application can get deployed. And also, this is the reason that app IAM resides within the GitOps workloads and not the app manifest repo, because the governance team need to be able to have access to this and then approve the PR. Now, let's, let me show you one of these use cases in action, creating a workload cluster and how, how this is done. So I recorded this demo. Cluster creation takes some time, so, so I record it. I hope I can play it. Right. Uh, I don't know how to pause it, but. Uh... <laughs> okay, so here we have this uh, structure. So what we need to do is under the cluster config, we need to add another folder for the new workload clusters that we need to create, right? We prepare the shell script for this copying of the template folder and replacing placeholders with the cluster name and, and other details, right? So we're going to execute this command. Here, this is a script name. We give to the, we give as parameters, we give to the script as parameters, the, the path of the GitOps system repo, the local clone on the system. And we give, it to also, we give to it also the name of the clusters that we want to create. In this case, commercial production. It's like a production environment for this commercial department within the organization. We execute this command. This will just make a copy and if you find replace uh, commands. You see here there's a new folder showed up under the clusters config, which contains the definition, which contains the definitions of, of the new cluster. Of course, this is a baseline configuration. You can change it based on the requirement for the specific cluster, right? What you have to do after that is just commit these changes, right? So we'll do get add then could com again, then get commit and then push the changes. And that's it, once, once you execute this command, Flux will start picking that up and acting on it and provisioning the cluster. You will see this shortly. So Crossplane acted on it, started communicating with the AWS APIs, started the creation activities for the new workload cluster. A few minutes and this cluster will be provisioned and in active state, right? And now it is, it is ready for starting deploying applications into it. The other use cases, I mean, I, I didn't demonstrate it because of the time constraints, but, but uh, we'll talk about the reference implementation shortly. 
So previously what you saw that was a flux that is running on the management cluster, reconciling our commit to create a new workload cluster. So we have this end-to-end -end implementation made available under AWS samples directory. I would like to extend my sincere thank to other AWS engineers and the SAs who worked on this project. Uh, myself and Islam are also conducting the same workshop for reInvent. If you are attending or planning to attend reInvent, please register for this workshop. EKS and the containers roadmap is publicly available on the GitHub. And we would really appreciate if you guys to go in there and then provide your specific requirements for multi-cluster management and what you are really expecting. Create an issue and then let us know. Yeah, uh, thank you for attending today's session. Uh, if you have any follow-on questions and would like to know more about the implementations and the solutions, we will be available in the booth tomorrow. So Some please. of you had questions. Sorry for not answering these questions while presenting, but, but we'll be available after the session to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much for, thank you. for being with for us. Thank you. Thanks for coming today. in today. Yeah.